Hello, this is Marcus Patchett, the nocturnal herbalist, and this is the first video on my channel. Yay! Right, what is a Western medical herbalist? For those of you who don't know, a Western medical herbalist, as the name implies, is somebody who uses Western herbs. That's uh, plants that are indigenous to Europe and North America primarily. Um, we're actually kind of magpies. We nick herbs from all over the world and use them from all over the world. But the, the main corpus of plants that we use is from uh, Europe. Um, so s common stuff like dandelion, uh, chamomile, calendula, just indigenous herbs and, and North American herbs like echinacea or... or uh, wild indigo, chili, anyway, loads of different herbs, but mainly those. And then we do steal herbs from other traditions if they're very useful, uh, if they get incorporated into the Materia Medica. Uh, Western herbal medicine is, uh, it's, it's very based on tradition, but what I love about it is that it's a bridge between the tradition, which is very empirical, meaning it's something that's based on experience and developed over time with practical use. So the practical uses of plants to treat wounds, to prevent infections, to, and so on and so forth. Plus it incorporates the science, the pharmacology. So this is one of the things that initially attracted me to Western herbal medicine. I initially had an arts background. Uh, oh, and for anyone who's interested in my personal biography, I'm not going to really go into that in great detail here. Um, I'll put some links to my website and to a sort of practitioner profile for my professional association, the Association of Master Herbalists. I'll put those links below so you can you can check out more information about me if you want. Um, but yeah, so Western herbal medicine, we use herbs from all over the world and it sort of uses the pharmacology and the scientific information in conjunction with the traditional information. So one of the criticisms of Western herbal medicine is that um, it's, it's not scientific enough. Uh, I kind of agree in a way because I think it's more of a context dependent art. Uh, I don't agree that it's not scientific enough. I think uh, there's plenty of science <laughs> and I think uh, we need that right brain, more esoteric, more artistic, more holistic, more integrative way of thinking. I wouldn't be a, a complementary medicine practitioner if I didn't believe that. Um, that's not to say that I think we need to chuck out science, uh, but I also think we, we shouldn't chuck out more magical thinking either. I think both are useful and both are valid. And it, it kind of bores me when people on either people sort of polarize and start shouting at each other about which of their individual ideologies is correct. I think there is a great deal of use to be had from good dialogue between people who adopt a more conventionally rationalist mindset and people who have a more esoteric or magical or holistic mindset. Anyway, that's just my personal view. So Western herbal medicine, it's empirical, uh, meaning experience-based uh, and based on history and historical uses and formulas. And it's also scientific. It takes on board pharmacological uh, and clinical research and uses those to uh, ratify or validate partially, in other words, to confirm traditional uses, but also to develop new uses. Uh, so, for example, hawthorn uh, was not used in traditional Western herbal medicine as a heart tonic, but uh, the pharmacological investigation of it real revealed that these compounds in Hawthorne called OPCs, oligomeric proanthocyanidins, are very strengthening to the heart muscle. And uh, clinical trials, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials, have shown that it is very beneficial in the early stages of uh, chronic heart failure, for example. So that use was added to the canon and is now a mainstream use for Hawthorne. Um, but the traditional uses of hawthorn, which were for kidney problems and uh, internal pains and digestive issues, are still relevant and to some degree may be explained by the modern pharmaceutical findings that hawthorn actually uh, improves circulation and uh, protects um, vascular muscles and uh, helps um, uh, 
the muscles in the linings of blood vessels and heart muscle use energy better. It basically uh, increases the level of a compound called cyclic AMP available to those kinds of cells, which is very uh, which means that it might help the circulation in the kidneys and in kidney failure that's one of the, the things which is often compromised the circulation in the little blood vessels in the kidneys and also in the guts and other other bits of your innards in your viscera um, which uh, means it can also benefit many other conditions too so the traditional indications aren't wrong but this is a, a fantastic example of where the science has really added to and focused the tradition and that's one of the things that really attracts me about Western herbal medicine. Um, I kind of feel that it's it, it gets to places that other things cannot reach. I think that plants do that very often because they're polypharmaceutical. They contain lots of chemicals working together or against each other or basically in characteristic ways that mean that every medicinal plant has a whole group of different effects uh, which um, add up to produce a characteristic range of properties uh, which a single drug just can't replicate. The, on the other hand, of course, single drugs, uh, because they are purified and, and made much stronger, can do things uh, uh, much more powerfully but in a sort of caricatured way that if used over time can produce imbalances. I mean, I'm talking very generally here. Um, for myself, I describe myself as a complementary practitioner rather than an alternative practitioner because um, personally, modern medicine has saved my life twice. I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for modern medicine. I think modern medicine is the best crisis medicine we've had in history. It is the best disease care medicine we have ever had. It can uh, save lives in acute and crisis situations more than any other system. On the other hand, it's, let's be honest, pretty crap in many uh, chronic situations and it's really appalling at disease prevention. And I think this is where some of the more traditional or holistic models come in. Uh, and I think that both sides actually have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, Right, so that's the bit with the science. The astrology, the other bit that I'm interested in, less scientific validation. It's not completely absent. There is a little bit of scientific backing for it. I'll put some links below to some interesting websites that you can have a, uh, a snoop around if you want to look at some of the science uh, supporting astrology, but it is pretty thin on the ground. Um, and I think the reason for that, uh, as much as I said that um, herbal medicine, and probably any medicine to, to a large extent, is a context-dependent art that is particularly true for astrology. Um, I think like all divination, it is absolutely nonsensical without specific context. So for example, I'm not an enormous fan of horoscopes in the newspaper. I think they're all right, and I do think they work sometimes. It's what's called a metalogue, uh, in other words, a meaningful coincidence. When you see something, that uh, your subconscious has guided you towards, let's say, for the sake of argument, that provides you with meaningful information. I think horoscopes can be useful in that way. Uh, another way of looking at it could be that it's just a reasoning error. I forget the name of the reasoning error, but it's basically you can read into them. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, uh, but I do like the traditional astrology, which is a lot more detailed and complex. And the criticism that has been made of it from some scientific quarters that in practice it may be based on things like cold reading, I don't think is valid because there's a lot of technique that goes into it. But even if, even if a lot of the predictive uh, sort of stuff in traditional astrology, even if a lot of the analysis that you uh, produce from astrology is based on cold reading or taking cues from the client without perhaps either the client or the astrologer being aware of it, I don't think it matters if it produces, if it benefits the client, if it's beneficial in the real world and it's meaningful and it's accurate. <laughs> so anyway, this is, a, I, I could go on and on and on about that, but the bottom line is I do think astrology, like herbal medicine, has very, very ancient roots and it is 
a way of thinking about the world that is very valuable um, in a world that is arguably losing meaning. I don't know if that's true, but in the sense that I think it was Viktor Frankl, who was a psychotherapist who was interned in the concentration camps in the Second World War, who said, uh, what was it? Suffering is despair without, no, other way around. Despair is suffering without meaning. So if you can find meaning in whatever's going on, then that will help to reduce or remove despair. And if you can reduce despair, then that massively improves prognosis or outcome, particularly in medical situations. Um, a lot of illness, um, one phrase I use a lot is whatever gets pushed down from the top comes out of the sides. Uh, in other words, if you have ongoing stress in any area, it will eventually manifest as disease. And there are various physiological explanations for that. Um, as a, if you want to look up the model on the internet, do a bit of Googling, you can look up uh, Hans Selye, that's S-E-L-Y-E, -E, and his general adaptation syndrome or GAS. It sounds like he was a scientist who was a bit flatulent, but that's not the case. His GAS, Hans Selye's GAS, was all about the ability of an organism to adapt to stress. Uh, and the general theory being, which he demonstrated, I think, with animal torture experiments, which personally being a vegan, not a fan of, but whatever, it's the current model of testing. He showed that when you subjected an organism to stress, at first it would show signs of stress, then it would kind of adapt to that stress and appear normal for a while, and then eventually it would collapse. Um, and of course that collapse can come about in, in various ways. So just to give you an example, um, you could have somebody who's constantly a little bit stressed and running a little bit of a, a adrenaline all the time. So that shuts down their digestive system a little bit. So maybe they're not producing enough digestive secretions constantly, a slightly lower level. So that starts to alter the chemistry, the terrain of the gut. They're not producing enough bile. They're not producing enough pancreatic enzymes. So they don't properly digest their food a little bit. Their gut isn't enough, isn't acidic enough because there's a, a lack of bile output or erratic bile output, let's say. And uh, that means that the net uh, chemistry of their gut changes and the microbiome changes. Uh, organisms start proliferating in their gut which perhaps shouldn't be there, which are a little bit naughty. Maybe those organisms are endotoxic, meaning that when they die, uh, their, their bodies are themselves somewhat toxic or produce inflammation, or they produce exotoxins. What they secrete is, is not good for us. And as those organisms proliferate in the gut, the person may develop digestive problems and may also start experiencing systemic issues due to a gradual increase in inflammation. And say they have a particular gene sequence like the HLA B27, uh, I think it's chromosome uh, or gene sequence, uh, which is linked that the, the existence of that uh, chromosome, I need to check that, but that particular packet of genetic material has been linked to various autoimmune disorders and if there's an increase in systemic inflammation that particular set of genes could get switched on and activate autoimmune disease. This is very hypothetical, it's just a very crude hypothetical model of how stress eventually could lead to the switching on of a latent or potential disease that is entirely avoidable and potentially could be reversed if the underlying stress could be got rid of. And of course that can be addressed on several levels, on the physical level, with diet, with medicines. The medicines, of course, I'm including herbs in that. Uh, conventional medicines tend to just shut down the inflammation, which of course can work because sometimes if you switch it off and switch it on again, the computer restarts and there's no problem, so to speak. <laughs> um, but you can address things on that physical level, but also addressing things on an emotional level, on a psychological level, and on the level of greater meaning is important. Anyway, I've kind of rambled on, bit of a tangential introduction. This hopefully gives you a bit of a flavor of the things I'm gonna be talking about on the channel. Basically, I'm gonna do videos about stuff I am interested in. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I will occasionally read comments. So if any of you have any ideas about things that you would like me to talk about, please do leave them in the comments. I may sometimes read them and, and pick them up, but otherwise I'm just gonna start off with things that I think may be of use and of interest. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. If you've made it to the end of this, 17 minutes, almost, that's almost too short for me. Right, uh, thank you and have a good day and, or evening or night or whatever it is. Bye.